I bio 30. Uh, I am going to start my first lecture on Mendelian genetics today. Um, I'm going to talk about primarily mono hybrid crosses today. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of an introduction and, and, and talk about what that means. Mono hybrid crosses is uh, Punnett squares in probability that it addresses just one genetic trait. Um, not two. I'll do dihybrid crosses in a different, um, um, in, a, uh, in, in a different lecture. So when we talk about genetics um, and we talk about probability, uh, we've been using um, Mendel style genetics for a long time with selective breeding, right? So uh, if we look at um, uh, the breeding of domesticated animals and we look at uh, agriculture, um, selective breeding uh, has been a it has been a long experiment in looking at genetic traits for a for uh, you know for millennia, right? Where we take the traits desirable traits of um, uh, parentals and put them together to make those traits more common. Um, that's how we have all of our different agricultural crops, right? We we have basically twelve staple crops uh, all over the world now, so it's very very. Selective and all of your different dog breeds are all the same species, right? They just had uh, different traits brought out to give them their different characteristics We're going to talk about this dude named Gregor Mendel um, So Mendel came up with came up with uh, you can say hi to my dogs. Hey, he's Kino um, uh, Anyway, Gregor Mendel uh, came up with a modern um, Genetic uh, inheritance theory. Um, Mendel was the first scientist to make a, a major breakthrough about the patterns of inheritance. Um, so Mendel, what he did, he's a very eccentric dude. He was uh, he was a religious man, and and he also uh, maintained his own pea garden. So he had about twenty eight thousand pea plants. So um, when if, when we look at Mendel, I'm going to go to the textbook. What do you want? Okay, get out of here. I'm working. Okay, Patterns of Inheritance in McGraw-Hill starts on page 584. I'm also going to use Nelson today um, a little bit. There's uh, good examples. Are you, I'm actually going to use men, uh, the Nelson textbook quite a bit in this unit. Okay, so Mendel, uh, he actually had, he looked at pea plants and he looked at seven main traits of pea plants. So this is figure 17.4 in your text, uh, in your McGraw-Hill textbook. So you can see stem length, pod shape, shape seed shape, all that stuff. Um, it's also right here. This is a figure, a table 17.1. So all the different traits that he looked at. Um, so this is what Mendel did. Uh, Mendel bred what we call true breeding stocks together. So if I look at one trait here, let's look at uh, uh, pod shape. No, actually, let's not look at that. Let's look at seed, seed shape, uh, round or wrinkled. Um, now, the, the trait on the left is dominant and the trait on the right is recessive. Okay. So uh, let's see, we looked at uh, seed shape. What Mendel always did was he bred, uh, he used three generations. Okay, and he would do this repeatedly. And he would breed what's called true breeding stock. So true breeders. Okay, are uh, homozygous. for a trait. Okay, so a true breeder, um, in this case, so if I look at uh, pod shape, uh, you either have round and that's dominant, or little r which is wrinkled and that's recessive. Okay. So he would breed something that, is, that was uh, round with wrinkled. Um, 
okay? Um, so these are, these are uh, if you remember your genotypes, right? We have three main genotypes. You have homo dominant or homozygous dominant, right? And that would be an individual that is uh, dominant for both alleles. Remember, you have to have two copies of each allele. for both alleles of a trait, right? So that would be big R, big R. Uh, you could have heterozygous. And that would be uh, one dominant and one recessive trait. And then you could have an individual that is homo recessive or homozygous recessive. And that would be little r, little r, so homozygous for both alleles. Right, so you have three main genotypes. Okay, homo dominant, heterozygous, and homo recessive. So if an individual is a true breeder, a true breeder is homozygous, regardless of if they're dominant or recessive, there's no heterozygosity. So Mendel did this with his pea plants. He would always breed a group of, um, True breeders together. Okay, so this would be called the P generation or the parental generation. Okay, um, and then so he would breed these two together, and right, you would make alleles from that, and then there would only be this allele and this allele. And then so you would breed those together to get a generation two. Um, and so this would be this allele with that allele. Okay, so they would be a hundred percent, there would be a hundred percent round and a hundred percent wrinkled pods. If we're looking at that trait, you would get this allele and this allele that would be in the second generation. So you would get 100% uh, round pods in the, this is called the F1 generation, or the first filial, filial meaning offspring. Okay, there'd be 100% round individuals, but they would be 100% heterozygous. Now Mendel didn't know this. He didn't know about alleles because he didn't know anything about DNA yet. But he knew that there were inheritance factors that would give these traits. We just didn't know what they were yet. All right, so you would take um, a parental generation and breed them together. You would get this feature, right? So 100% dominant um, outward expression for the F1, right? So remember, these are genotypes. So those would be your genotypes. Um, you would get 100% dominant phenotypes for the F1, right? And the phenotype is the uh, expression of the characteristic, right? So the outward expression would be 100% round and none would be wrinkled, but that's determined by the genotype, right? And remember there's two genotypes that would give you round, right? Big R, big R, big R, little r, okay? So 100% phenotype, dominant phenotype in the F1. And then what Mendel would do is he would breed two F1s together. And uh, so you would be, you, so you would have big R, little r, and big R, little r. And this is be your F2 generation, your second filial generation. And this would be what we would call, right? These would be grand, uh, grandchildren, I guess. And then you would have this allele, and that allele, so you have two alleles from each, right? And um, what would happen is, all right, so this is a Punnett square for, um, this is called a monohybrid cross, okay? All right, so this is a monohybrid cross because we're looking at one trait of inheritance.
So I'm only looking at pod shape. I'm not looking at pod shape and pod color, for example. I'm only looking at one trait. So you should understand that term monohybrid. All right, and what we would get in the F2 with this pattern, right, so one allele goes here, one allele goes here. Right, so what would happen is, is there would be um, this ratio. So when we look at the phenotypic ratio, this would be a round pod, round pod, round pod, and wrinkled pod. So there would actually be this um, three round to one wrinkled, um, or 75% dominant to 25% recessive in the F2. So whenever you put two true breeders together, you would get an F1 that was completely dominant phenotype, and then the recessive phenotype would show up in predictable ratios in the F2. Right, so about 25% of the F2 would be the original recessive true breeder. Okay, so Mendel did this over and over and over and over again, and he was able to establish our patterns of inheritance as a result. Okay. All right, so like I said, Mendel bred true breeding stocks together. Um, he used these monohybrid crosses with one trait. He would use true breeders in the P. The F1 would uh, be created from the P, and then the F2 would show the traits of um, the P generation again uh, in predictable ratios. So this just shows... Uh, again, this shows um, uh, Mendel's, uh, these are the, the uh, features that he looked at, and then this shows what I just showed you. So that you had a true breeding P generation, the F1 generation would be completely heterozygous, and then you would take two F1s to make an F2, and Mendel repeated this over and over and over and over again to give us uh, what our laws of inheritance were. Um, it was very uh, landmark work showing that you need a large body of data to determine trends in science and kind of revolutionize the scientific process. So what Mendel observed was that for every trait, the F1 generation showed only one of the two parental characteristics. Although all of the F1 plants had a copy of each form of the inheritance factor, which we now know are genes, right? Um, the one that was expressed, he called the dominant factor, and the one that was not expressed was called the recessive factor. Um, and the dominant factor was completely dominant uh, over the recessive trait. Okay. Um, so Mendel came up with three laws from this. And what we got, right, so we have, I'm going to put this up. Give me a second here. So we got Mendel's uh, three laws of inheritance. So the first law is the law of segregation. And the law of segregation tells us that alleles of the same trait um, they separate during gamete formation without linkage. So we can get these predictable ratios as a result. So they're not linked to each other. Um, I'm going to show you later on that sometimes alleles are linked um, because of the distance they are away from each other on DNA. It doesn't violate Mendel's laws, but um, it's, a, it's an addition on to the rules because we now know how DNA works. So if we had, a, again, like if we had R and R, this would um, separate and this would separate without being packaged together. 
in predictable ratios. And remember, when this happens, when traits separate, this happens during crossing over of meiosis. Right, so during gamete formation and during crossing over, these alleles are not linked, so they will um, end up separating with equal probability and they'll end up in gametes with equal probability. Um, rule number two for Mendel is the law of independent assortment. Okay, and the law of independent assortment tells us that genes of different traits. Okay, my chalk is done. Okay, this tells us genes of different traits. Uh, also separate without linkage, okay? So if I have, um, you know, round um, pod shape and uh, let's say we have a uh, pod color, which could be yellow, these two traits Right, so uh, shape and color, they would also not be linked. And I'm gonna talk about that more when we talk about dihybrid crosses or when you have two traits together. But these also separate in predictable ratios because they're not linked with each other, okay? Um, Mendel's third law is the law of dominance. Okay, and the law of dominance tells us that uh, one uh, inheritance factor is expressed completely over another. And that's how we get homozygous dominant and heterozygous and homozygous recessive traits. So one allele will be expressed over another. So those are Mendel's three laws. Okay, um, I'm gonna expand on the law of dominance as well. I'm gonna talk about co-dominant, incomplete dominant. So there's some special cases where we have a, you know, multiple dominant traits, for example. And uh, it, it, it extends onto the, uh, the theory, but the, um, the original point um, is true. We've just uh, learned more about it over time. So this is what law of segregation tells us, right? Uh, we get these ratios in his pea plants because um, uh, because of segregation. Okay, um, so alleles for the same trait, that's what this tells me right here. You can read that. We, so we now know that these inheritance factors that Mendel um, called, uh, what he called inheritance factors, he didn't know what they were. Um, we now know that they're called alleles, right? So they're forms of genes. But Mendel did this before we had uh, looked at the DNA double helix or deciphered even what genetics were. Okay, so he understood how patterns arose, but he did not understand where the source of that came from. Okay, and then we get our different genotypes, right? Homozygous, heterozygous, and dominant and recessive homozygosity, right? So that's what this points out. So you should understand the difference again, right? Now, you'd already, we already looked at this in ecology, but the genotype, right, is a combination of alleles for any traits. The phenotype is the outward characteristics of the offspring, and we use Punnett squares to figure this stuff out. All right, so this is another Mendelian genetics um, Punnett square from Mendel. Uh, this is uh, pod color. So yellow uh, pod color is dominant to green pod color. Um, you always put, whenever you have a dominant allele, it doesn't matter which part of the part of where it comes from, the dominant allele always comes first. So you can see that this is a homozygous recessive green pod, and this is a heterozygous and a yellow pod, okay? So you get, uh, so this is the, this would be the genotype 
probabilities that come from um, this breeding pair, right? So you should expect to see 50% of the offspring green and 50% of the offspring yellow. Um, remember, this is a probability, so there's equal chance that every time there's reproduction happening between this breeding pair, right? It doesn't mean that, you know, offspring one is here, offspring two is here. It's always 50-50. So all of them could be yellow and all of them could be green. It's always kind of a flip of the coin in this case, but that's just the probability that you would expect to see. There's another one with flamingos. This one is uh, a true breeding dominant individual. And then this is a uh, recessive blue individual. And this would make all of the offspring red and they would all be heterozygotes because they would get one dominant A from this guy and one recessive A from the blue. Okay, so uh, this is an important concept to test cross. Okay, um, I'm going to look at your uh, McGraw-Hill textbook, page 596. Uh, this is question three. So in zucchini, yellow-colored flesh is recessed with the white-colored flesh. You are a plant breeder and would like to know if any of the white flesh zucchini you have are heterozygous for the yellow flesh allele. How would you determine this? Okay, so I'm going to come back to this. So a test cross um, is a concept that takes advantage of the law of dominance. Um, so it's a cross between an unknown dominant genotype with a homozygous recessive organism. So if I were, I'm going to put this up. So you're actually going to have a question like this on your quiz, and it's asking about sheep, black wool sheep, and you have to show this. Okay, so here's what a test cross is. A test cross is, um, is a homozygous recessive individual. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to find out the genotype of an unknown dominant phenotype. Okay, so this is what we do, all right? We don't know if the individual that shows the dominant phenotype is homozygous dominant or heterozygous. Okay, so a test cross is always a homo recessive individual. Okay. So, um, in zucchini, that's what this question says, question three. Okay, uh, yellow colored flesh is recessive to white colored flesh. So, if we look at this, um, W is white and little w would be yellow. So the question is asking, how would I determine this? Right. So the way we would do this to show this is we would breed. So that so way to determine whether or not uh, an unknown dominant phenotype is recessive is a uh, heterozygous or or homozygous. What you would do is you would breed the dominant individual with a test cross, and you would determine what the genotype is of the dominant phenotype by the offspring. All right. So if, okay, so breed dominant individual with a test cross, okay? 
So you're going to breed the dominant individual with a test cross. Um, and so and you'll look at the patterns. So you know that if this guy is homozygous dominant, right, so if homo dominant right all offspring and I should do this W shoot. all right all offspring are white because white is dominant to yellow flesh in zucchinis all right so this should be a big W little W big W little W, okay? So if he's dominant, there's gonna be no yellow fleshed offspring, right? Um, now, if the test cross is crossed with a heterozygous individual, right, you will get, uh, there'll be some yellow zucchini. So this is what you would do with a test cross. You would breed a homozygous recessive individual with a dominant phenotype, and you would see if any of the offspring ended up um, with the recessive phenotype. Okay, so that's how we would answer this question. You're a plant breeder and would like to know if any of the white flesh zucchini you have are heterozygous for the yellow fleshed allele. How would you determine this? So what you would do is you would breed dominant phenotypes with um, a test cross and the um, uh, breeding pairs that showed yellow colored flesh would tell you that the unknown dominant phenotype would be heterozygous. Okay, and that's what this shows here. Um, So you have a question like that on your quiz and you would need to show it like that, right? You would show that some of the offspring of the dominant phenotype would be, uh, would show a recessive phenotype if heterozygosity occurs. Um, so heredity starts in Nelson on page 596. So it's kind of all over the place, but Mendel starts here on page 598. Um, go through this textbook. There's lots of practice questions. Uh, page 600 here has practice questions. Okay. Um, right, so there's more page 602. I'm not going to do all these questions here. 602, 603. Um, here's another test cross question. This is page 604. It says, a fish breeder has a red male cichlid of unknown parentage. Red color is dominant to yellow in the fish. He must know whether the fish is heterozygous for these colors. Um, the fish breeder would breed a test cross with the unknown dominant phenotype, and then you would show the Punnett squares. Right, um, if some of the recessive phenotypes, some of the fish were yellow, you would know that male was um, heterozygous and not homozygous dominant. Okay, um, I'm gonna do this question page 604, number two. And this is in your Nelson textbook. I'm actually just gonna pull out okay so the question says for Mexican hairless dogs the hairless trait is dominant to hairy so big H equals hairless and little H equals hairy 
A litter of eight pups is found. Six are hairless. So this shows six are big H uh, whatever. And two are little H, little H. Okay. So this is page 604, number two. Okay, so six are, are hairless and two are hairy. So you know that there's eight total and 25% of them are recessive, right? So the question asks, what are the genotypes of the parents? So I'm actually gonna work backwards from here. So what I see is, I see that. Okay, so 25% would be uh, homozygous recessive. So the parents, in order for that ratio to happen, have to be heterozygotes, right? So these are your parents. So your parents are big H times little h. Big H, little h, big H, little h. So both parents are heterozygous. Okay. Um, I'm going to go back to page 591 in McGraw-Hill. Um, so this, practice problems number one and number, number two is the exact same thing as number one. It just shows it to you in a different way. So this says Mendel crossed true breeding plants that had yellow pods with true breeding plants that had green pods. Using the information in table 17.1, predict and write down the genotypes and phenotypes of the F1 and F2 generations. So, so you're going to have a question like this as well. So this is one McGraw Hill. You're going to have this on a quiz, but it'll be a dihybrid cross, not a monohybrid cross. Uh, so uh, yellow pods, um, figure 17.1. Pod, uh, so Mendel crossed true breeding plants that had yellow pods with true breeding plants that had green pods. Okay, so pod color. Um, green, in this case, is dominant and yellow is recessive for pod color. So you had true breeding plants with yellow pods. Um, so yellow pods would be a little g, little g, because I'm going to use the green. And then green pods were dominant. Um, green pods. And those are big g, big g, because they are true breeders. Okay, so they are true breeders. Um, it says predict and write down the genotypes and phenotypes of the F1 and F2 generations. Predict the ratio of F2 plants with green pods to F2 plants with yellow pods. So let's do this. So the P generation, 